So uh, nice to be here. I'm Ben Grosso, Rob Foley, as you now know. I'm a psychiatrist. I worked at the Alaska Native Medical Center from 1988 to 1992. It's nice to come back to Alaska. Uh, it's been a long time. And uh, there was a handout that was emailed, and I believe it may have been uh, sent out to folks who are not here in the room, but it's available. Uh, we can make it available as well uh, after the presentation. Uh, Rob and I have become close friends. Uh, we've been working together on trying to make veterans' lives better for the last four years or so. We have a model that we think is rather unique, and we believe it works, that uh, has been helpful to veterans that we have worked with uh, in our, each in our capacity. Uh, and our, one of the big sort of overreaching goals is to bridge the abyss between civilians and veterans. Veterans who come back from combat uh, find it very difficult to reassimilate into the civilian world. There is a huge gap there. Uh, I will tell you a little bit about my story of working for the VA from 19, or excuse me, from 2008 to through 2013. Uh, I will talk with you a little bit about what I have characterized as a scientific allegory or a simple way of thinking about the three brains that we have in our head, three brains in one, and a little bit about evolutionary psychology, uh, and also on how PTSD is actually really not an illness, it's a natural response to the horrors of war. We have uh, developed a simple model for uh, body alarm management, which we will discuss as well. Uh, we have a long-term goal of uh, helping veterans on a more intensive uh, level not only reassimilating, but also veterans who have been on the verge of taking their lives. Rob Foley has been working with such veterans on a one-to-one -one basis and uh, using uh, wellness modalities, particularly his work with horses. So my challenge to the audience, those uh, in the room and those elsewhere, uh, or our challenge, I should say, is uh, for those of you who have not, uh, to really look around you and to get to know some of the veterans that are in our midst. And here in the state of Alaska, I believe 10% of the population are, are veterans. Rob. Thank you, Robert Foley. And uh, it's an honor to be here today. Um, in discussing how to speak veteran, I often will convey to those that I work with uh, and those that work with me, that it is uh, absolutely imperative, uh, important that uh, when speaking veteran, speaking to veterans, that we take and leave that personal ego aside, leave it out. Uh, we listen to the veteran and we give way to the veteran with respect, remain open with respect to body language, Appreciate different world views because we all have different world views. Treat the veteran encounter as a co-learning experience. This is important. I actually probably could learn something from you and perhaps you could learn something from me as well. So I, um, I have lived with uh, traumatic brain injury for a number of years. PTSD for many years. I've struggled with other body symptoms, uh, with my optic nerve and other parts of my body. And uh, this, is, this has been a major challenge for me uh, in the civilian community and with my family and um, living in that civilian world and accessing health care can be very difficult. It has been very difficult for me I've spent a good 10 years trying to access health care, and um, uh, it's, it's been a difficult road for me. And uh, working with veterans, I certainly want to help them along the way, their individual pathway. Um, I am an intentional uh, peer support navigator for veterans. I'm trained through NAMI, I'm trained in suicide assist, and I help these veterans that I receive, uh, often generally one veteran at a time. Um, I introduce them to some of the wellness therapies that I use in my life, 
My life is not directed or controlled by medications. I don't use medications. I, I've pretty much eliminated all medications from, uh, f f from, my, from my daily life. And uh, immersion into wellness therapies is what I focus on. I am Passamaquoddy uh, from Maine, Native American culture. And uh, that happens to be one of my therapies with my elders and my culture. Equine uh, assisted psychotherapy. The psychotherapist, by the way, is not two-legged. My psychotherapist is four-legged. I have over 40 of these animals. And I communicate with them. I live with them. I sleep with them, I walk with them, I do things with horses that most folks just cannot believe. But this is where I establish the trust. This is where I establish my hope through these four-legged creatures. Many of the virtues I live by, I did not pick these up from people, I picked them up from the horses that I work with. We're gonna save, I know there'll be questions and please, uh, these questions we want to answer, we want to get to, and we'll, we'll certainly we'll want to address all your questions towards the end. Um, so along with the wellness therapies and the equine assisted and many other wellness therapies that I'll talk about my experience with uh, body alarm management and the work to date uh, I'll talk about uh, that I do with sui uh, the uh, veterans uh, with suicide ide ideation and on a one-to-one -one for intensive um, situations with these veterans and introducing them into wellness immersion and what I refer to as the mix. We'll, we'll, we will get into the mix uh, a little bit a little bit later here. Thank you. Next slide is uh, <clears throat> you see an individual here who's trained, prepared. He's trained and prepared to make a split decision split second decision and oftentimes hesitation or jumping the gun can be a veteran's own worst enemy. So calming the nerves with this particular individual in this image, knowing when, and then executing with spot on accuracy by killing his target or an individual and knowing this individual knowing that by doing such, committing an act such as this, a, a difficult act of taking a life, in essence, he has to believe, or she has to believe, that she is saving one of her own. That is uh, the message in this image here. I could say to you, 22 veterans a day commit suicide. Now I could say, next slide. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to give you more than that. This is powerful, and the message I want to send here is that, yes, 22 to 23 veterans end their lives by the end of today. By the time we finish our talk, one veteran will end their life by the time we finish our conversation. Referencing a, another veteran that I admire, uh, his public speaking, Mike Haney, he talks about issues of citizenship, responsibility, and morality. So when I talk about 22 veterans uh, ending their life by their own hands by the end of today, uh, I also share things uh, that, uh, that are very important regarding our veterans returning home and the struggle, the extreme struggle they experience to find work, to assimilate back into community and society. And in most cases, they cannot. 20% of the nation's suicides of the entire country, the entire nation, 20% of the nation's suicides are military veterans, 20%, even though they represent only 10% of the entire population. More veterans have died by their own hands than those killed in the Iraq Afghanistan conflict combined. Veterans returning home feel anonymous. Think about that. Anonymous within their own community. 2012, General McChrystal stated, never again should the cost and consequences of war be so disconnected from society and its citizens. That was his message in 2012. It made the networks 
and lasted an hour and was removed that comment because of how offensive that would be received or taken or received by, by citizens uh, from around the country. Why do you think so many veterans coming home feel anonymous? That's my question. And I say to you, it's because we feel we have disconnected the costs and consequences of war from all of you. We've taken them away from all of you. Over the course of the last 12 years, the burden of these wars have been shouldered by less than 1% of all Americans. The entire country, less than 1%, 0.5 actually, shouldered, shouldered by Americans. Chances are very good that if we're talking about 0.5% of all Americans, chances are very good that the returning veteran is not your son, is not your brother, is not your neighbor, and most likely not a teammate, you know. Um, far too many Americans are not invested in many of these returning veterans. Not enough of you, not enough of us are invested in their future. When you made the decision, as a country, when we made the decision to defer the defense of this country over to the John Doe's and Mary Ellen Doe's of our military, we made a moral obligation when we deferred the defense of our, uh, the, to this country over to our veterans. And that moral obligation is rather quite simple, actually. It's John Doe and our men and women veterans want you to know them. They want you to know them uh, for they are somebody. Next slide. Thank you. Teammate of mine, uh, I am former Navy SEAL. Uh, excuse me, let me, wrong slide, let me go back there. I entered the service in 73, Vietnam. And I had a choice of, actually I was hoping to go to Vietnam, and I went to the Middle East. This was new, the Middle East. Uh, my country chose not to send me to Vietnam, and I went straight to Lebanon during a civil war, and then on to Bahrain. The British had just left this godforsaken little area in the Middle East, and uh, it was far away from Vietnam, and I wondered what I was doing there. Uh, it was immediate culture shock for me. I was one of the first uh, initial groups sent over there. And uh, I was not trained. I was thrown into this foreign culture without guidelines. I had no knowledge, no experience with this culture. And um, I was told that there was, uh, I was there to represent the United States and I would act accordingly. What did that mean? I really didn't know what that meant, to act accordingly to American foreign interests in the Middle East. I was just here in this godforsaken place. I didn't know the culture. I didn't have a place to stay. Uh, the base was very, very small. Um, I soon realized in, my short, in, in the first couple of months there that this was really about foreign interests and oil. And, um, and while we were there, Americans were now there, present in Bahrain. Half of the Saudi Emirate families in the region were against our presence in the Middle East. The Russians were against our presence in the Middle East. Uh, this was a base that was previously run by the British. And uh, so we were forced, when I arrived, we were forced to live off base. We were forced to just go find a place within the community, within the city, and find a place to live. And this proved to be very dangerous for us, uh, life-threatening environments on a daily basis. Uh, I spent a little over a year there in the Middle East, learning the language and its customs. Um, I began dressing and speaking as they did. Uh, the base, the primary base was point A. Um, we kept weapons there. We couldn't transport weapons between point A and point B. We couldn't show signs of aggression in any way. That was about 10 miles between point A and point B. Point B was much smaller. Uh, we traveled back and forth uh, daily. Uh, in a non-aggressive manner, being vulnerable to uh, attack, to roadside uh, conflicts. And about six, seven months into my stay there, uh, Faisal bin, uh, actually the King Faisal himself was assassinated by his nephew, uh, Faisal bin Musad. And now this became a very, very dangerous region because this was 
a lot of folks in the region felt it was a Western conspiracy, this assassination. My roommate and teammate was killed on the road. We were involved in roadside attacks. Uh, orders were not to engage. And uh, our base at one point was under threat of uh, being under attack, not once but twice. We had to race back to that base to protect that base. Towards the end of my Middle East tour, um, I was abruptly taken out of theater and sent back to the United States because Intel had it that uh, I was a target, myself personally, and my commanding officer um, felt it was in the best interest to send me back. And this was all for pre-SEAL time? This, this, was is, before pre this is pre-SEAL. This was as 18 or 19, right? Right, about 18 or 19. Yeah. And um, I was sent back to the United States for their concern for my health, welfare, and safety. And uh, uh, eventually I was to report to SEAL Team 2 under Commander Dick Marcinko. And uh, there I supported SEAL Team 2 and with their Southeast Asia um, uh, missions and POW extractions and the horrors of many uh, of uh, missions I don't discuss today of what, went, what was involved in, in their missions in Southeast Asia. Um, I was sent through training, became a Navy SEAL and uh, went on to serve a number of years in the teams. And uh, in my experiences serving in the teams um, under different missions and assignments around the world, I lost many teammates, many teammates, close teammates. Um, I, too many, and became desensitized to the whole loss and effect of uh, losing teammates. Um, I never, after my first six years of service, I tried to assimilate back into society. It was difficult, extremely difficult. I returned back home in uniform in a civilian airport. I was spat upon. And um, uh, how do I tell you how difficult that is to experience that and go on to try to assimilate back into my community? Difficult. Um, had an incident where um, I was basically physically grabbed and by a civilian, and the civilian ended up in a hospital in a coma uh, by my hands. I was not prepared or ready to come back into society and reassimilate with my community. I didn't know how to. So this was a, um, I did enroll in a local university uh, on the West Coast. I, I basically, you could see me walking between buildings alone, never with anyone, by myself. Um, I was unaware of my behaviors. I was un unaware of who I was as a person, but not by others. Others would see me and, and really, uh, they would prefer to stay away from me, uh, intense, standoffish, that's how they viewed me. Um, I made them nervous, uh, scared perhaps. You didn't trust them? I didn't trust them, they didn't trust me, they felt sorry for me. Uh, this, this was difficult for me, that people would feel sorry for me, I didn't want anyone feeling sorry for me. Um, finished my college years and went on to find employment and couldn't find employment. Uh, because of that simple word on my resume, that I was a veteran and I was a Navy SEAL. Job after job after job turned down. I spent the next 14 years removing that identifier, never discussing that I was in the military, never discussing that I was a Navy SEAL, because I was now ashamed. I was ashamed to even breach the, the topic of being in the military and being a Navy SEAL. I deleted all my reference to military service for years. Uh, I kept my family from it for many, many years until my daughters were 12 and 9, 10 years old. They didn't even know what dad did. Uh, I preferred it that way. So the entire involvement uh, uh, in the Middle East pre-9-11 and post-9-11 for me had disastrous consequences on my family. I'm not any different, I'm really no different than many of these veterans that come back trying to assimilate back into their community and culture and they find it extremely difficult. So um, uh, all the things I talk about veterans are going through today, uh, that's with my family, out in public, going into public places, I can't do it. I, I, driving my car I, with my family, I can't do it. I can't drive from point A to point B because someone's coming up on my left side and I'm speeding up. I'm going under, under an overpass and I'm looking up. Uh, 
my family is wondering, my family is thinking we're afraid. We're afraid of dad. We're afraid of what is wrong. He needs help. We need help. So this was, this is an ongoing thing. This is what our veterans face. And uh, fortunately, for now in, in the last several years, I've learned of my medical consequences, and they're severe, extremely severe. And I'm trying to live my life to the fullest by serving others in need and uh, utilizing these wellness modalities that I'll talk about. And um, if I may, I'll go to the next slide. This is what I talk about. I talk about, uh, I love my family. There's nothing wrong with that. I love them and it's my job to protect them from everything and everyone. And this is how I show my love. Someone says, you love your family? Yes, I protect them. No, I asked if you love them. Yes, I do, I protect them. I'm trying to get back into my old routine, but I just can't seem to find a way. My family is scared, they're confused, they don't understand me as much as I don't understand myself. It's getting worse. And I can't seem to, uh, I can't see the invisible pain that my family is experiencing. I believe my children need me with the dangers lurking around every corner. Uh, this is the life I live. Uh, if we have to go out uh, to restaurants, I need to pick the location in the restaurant where I sit my back to the wall, looking at the doorway and uh, to assess any and all threats. This is today, this is now. This is what a lot of our veterans, men and women go through. Um, outside my house, and the image you see here, this was my home, sandbagged. Not literally. But, but very much. Figuratively. Figuratively. Um, watching and, and taking note of every vehicle coming down the street, up the hill. Um, it, it's, it's ridiculous. It absolutely is. Can you help me? My family is afraid of me. I'm, I'm wondering right now what is wrong with me. And, and for many, many years, that was my question. What is wrong with me? Next, next slide, please. And I think this is yours. So <clears throat> that's a bit of a snapshot of you know, Rob's experience as a veteran. It's hard to capture. It's hard to portray here. Uh, but I hope it gives you a sense. And as Rob said, for uh, all combat, that's uh, they have had experiences that are hard for us to grasp if we have not been there and not done it. I'm not a veteran, so I don't understand. Um, and I don't know if any of you do. I know at least one of you in the audience does. Um, but I went to work for the VA from uh, 2008 through 2013. I got to know several hundred veterans. Uh, I really learned a lot uh, about the lives of the veterans uh, in our midst. And I will give you just one example. It's, uh, does anybody in the room or elsewhere know what a LERP is? LERP, L-R-R-P. A LERP is a long range reconnaissance patrol. And I learned about this. I didn't know what a LERP was before going to the VA. Uh, one of my patients educated me. The, the photo is from uh, 1967 and these were actual LERPs, uh, Army Rangers who, uh, Special Forces, who would go behind enemy lines for da several days at a time, uh, small groups of five or six men or so. And again, imagine uh, behind enemy lines in Vietnam, uh, and they would be uh, reporting on the impact of bombing runs or other things, or, or troop size, or troop movements, all sorts of stuff, and would occasionally engage the enemy. But the point was not to be seen uh, and not to engage if at all possible. So these men had to first master the jungle. And again, if you can put yourself there momentarily in Vietnam, uh, imagine the heat, the darkness, the intense darkness, uh, the, the creatures, the snakes, tigers, leeches, bugs, uh, monsoons, uh, an extraordinary place to master itself, just the jungle. And then mastering the enemy. Uh, both the North Vietnamese Army, the NVA, and the Viet Cong, who are more guerrilla uh, types, uh, and then being literally in their midst. <laughs> so the fellow that came to see me was a LERP. Uh, it took him about 10 trips to uh, be able to get into the building. He drove up to the building 10 times before he could get out of his truck and get in the building. 
uh, because of feeling it was an untrustworthy environment. <clears throat> and uh, it took longer for him to get to my office. It took a lot of patience on my part, and it took time and courage on his part to trust that this was an okay thing to do. Um, two years into coming to see me on a monthly basis, he uh, was able to tell me, uh, without my prodding him, that uh, the last kill that he had in Vietnam was a young woman, a, a young woman in her teenage years or so, who had uh, happened down a path and had come across their, their squad or whatever. Uh, and of course, they could not uh, allow her to continue back and report on them. So he killed her, he stabbed her, and put a knife through her and stuck her on a tree. And he was telling me his anger at her having come down the path and having forced him and forced his hand, literally, to have to take her out because that was, he could not let her live. So it gives a tiny, tiny taste of what men and women have gone through in uh, serving our country. This is uh, Sergeant Castle or Cassell from Fallujah in 2004, Marine Corps, who fell on a grenade to protect his fellow Marines. It took several rounds, and it sort of illustrates, if you can imagine, again, being in his shoes. Um, and I saw several veterans who were in his shoes. For example, a young Marine Corps uh, veteran who served in Fallujah, and then coming back to the United States, uh, he had trouble treating his children like children. He found that he couldn't love his children. He had no feeling for them. He saw these little people and he treated them like little Marines. Rob mentioned driving under overpasses. He would drive under an overpass and have to switch lanes. His brain was still back in Fallujah. <coughs> he would have to do that because even though his rational brain saying this is not happening in Maine, uh, that was how you stayed alive in, uh, in country. Uh, if you drove past something that looked like an IED, some roadside debris, of obviously you changed lanes. And this was part of his day-to-day -day experience. Basically, he was still there, his still in Fallujah, and he could not just turn that switch off. Uh, he served as sort of a bodyguard, as Rob has mentioned. He, he felt his job was to guard his family, not necessarily to love and engage them in a conventional civilian way. Uh, and he was not uh, well received for that. His wife found him to be very unloving. She thought that when they'd go out to dinner in his roving eyes, she thought he was being, uh, he was checking out other women in the restaurant. In fact, he was scanning and making sure that there's no one coming who was carrying and was a threat to his family or to his wife. And that's kind of how it goes. So I realized uh, after you know, six months to a year in my experience with the VA is that this is a different ball game than the average civilian world. And I went back to a simple concept that some of you know of the three brains in one, or the triune brain. Some of the basic points here are that the brain is a very, very old organ. The, there are three brains inside your head and mine. The oldest is the reptilian or survival brain. That literally just runs our body's organs, more or less, and allows us to, when attacked, to either run away or to respond with an attack. There are no feelings and there's no thought. We then, and that's 250 million years old. It's a very, very ancient piece of wiring that's sort of at the foundation of our, our wiring system. There's then the feeling brain, which is 150 million years old, people think. And again, it's the feeling brain enables us to have uh, things like emotions, like love, sadness, hate. We keep from eating our young because we have empathy and, and warmth and love, and, and uh, so that brings us a capacity for feeling. And the thinking brain, which most of us think of as the brain, the big convolutions you see in pictures of the brain, is really only about three million years old. Uh, it tries to make sense of all this. It gives us language and insight and uh, the ability to, to plan and ex exercise forethought. So one of the key points is that the old system is the default system. When things are falling apart and you feel under threat, the reptilian or survival brain kicks in. Now in combat, what seems to happen is that the survival brain is turned on high alert. It's like at an on button that with no off button, all right? And the feeling brain is shut down. You cannot function in combat if you're feeling empathy or remorse for taking out the enemy. And the thinking brain is just trying to make sense of it all. And what seems to happen is um, that it gets stuck like this. There's no off button. You don't you know, step off the airplane or however you're coming back and from you know, deployment. And, and shut this system down the way it's working. So that's why veterans are still functioning in this capacity when they come back. The other thing 
which we can't get into in any detail today, is that veterans come back as truth tellers. They have seemed to have lost the ability, whether it's a good one or not, for gossip and for a sort of social chit chat that has sort of meaningless conversation in many ways, but it, in, that much of us engage in. And they're these sort of direct start truth tellers, which we find often somewhat uh, uh, uncomfortable. So imagine yourself um, serving in, let's say, Iraq or Afghanistan, and imagine that uh, you know there's been an IED, and this is what your vehicle looks like, and you are perhaps one of the few survivors. And I'm hoping people in the remote sites are able to see, but if not, you can imagine and have seen things in the news. And imagine coming back. I think this is a compelling photo um, because when veterans come back, the way they're uh, in the usual sort of medical model, they're you come in, a combat vet who is having flashbacks and nightmares and re-experiencing this traumatic event. Uh, certain smells bring him or bring her back to the smell of blood and death and, and horrific things. And the veteran is told, well, you have flashbacks, nightmares, re-experiencing emotional numbness or numbing. You have PTSD. PTSD is a mental illness. You have a disorder. Uh, not everyone gets it. For some reason, you have it. You should man up or woman up and uh, accept the fact that you have a mental illness. We can treat you with medication and we can treat you with psychotherapy. It's the medical model. Now, our approach is somewhat different. Uh, and the, the approach would be more like this, that, uh, look, you have, you have served in combat. There are these three brains, in, the story of the three brains in one, that, you're, that this notion of post-traumatic stress disorder is a powerful notion, but it was created uh, in the early 1980s by the American Psychiatric Association with all the best of intentions. But what is really happening is you are having a natural and predictable response to the horrors of war. Any of us, any of you in the room or out in the, uh, elsewhere in Alaska that are listening or may watch this later on, if you were exposed to similar traumatic events, you would have the same thing to varying degrees, but you would have the re-experiencing, the you would have the hypervigilance because we're wired to have that. That's how we're built. So it is a normal reaction to the horrors of war. I got this. I know. Oh, yeah. So uh, that's what PTSD is. So, but we normalize it. So the person coming out, this this young man, I would say, look, you're, you're okay. You're going to be okay. You have this. It is a normal reaction to the horrors of war. You're not mentally ill, because veterans don't like to be thought of as having a mental illness, not that there's anything wrong with having it. Um, but we will teach you some things. We will help you to live with this adjustment that your brain has made. Um, you'll, you can be okay. And that some of the things that we call PTSD may actually come out in your favor. And some of the things will actually be very difficult to live with. You know, for example, this instinctual response to things like, again, passing, um, I had a Vietnam veteran who, uh, every time he got in his truck, he, w he saw the bullet hole where he was shot and he could feel in his shoulder where he was shot 45 years ago, and he would drive differently. So these things don't necessarily go away, um, but we can help you to live with them. But it's very uh, comforting to hear the truth, more complex truth, that you're not crazy. So one of the notions we've come up with is um, a non-illness-based uh, approach that says, look, you have a body alarm system. We all do. No one has taught any of us how to live with this alarm system, uh, but we, it's there. In, in life-threatening situations, your heart should pound. You should feel th short of breath. You should feel like you're going to take off or you have to defend yourself that you can. Um, and, and again, it's reassuring to hear that, look, you're don't take this personally. You have ancient biology in your body and brain. We all do. You are not mentally ill. The, the goal is going to be, coming back to the sort of meta metaphor or allegory or so of the three brains in one, is that we're going to try to help your survival brain to tone it down a little bit, right? Let go of some of the hypervigilance and the rage and other things. We're going to help your feeling brain to sort of pump it back up so you get some feelings like uh, care, caring for your children and your loved ones and empathy and warmth and those sorts of things. And your thinking brain, we will help it to sort of reformulate this and navigate. That's what we do. Question. Some I would 
uh, generally a question I'd like to ask in the very beginning. How many here have a son, a daughter, right now, serving? Show of hands. How many here in this room have uh, uh, a relative serving right now? Okay. Okay. Can go to this slide for a sec. Yeah, the Navy. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe That's the only way. This is where we're at. Okay. So the, the, these are some practical things that Rob will discuss. As a civilian? Yes. Okay. Well, certainly CIA, you know, can involve an extraordinary amount of exposure to risk, as we all can imagine. Um, but now we're trying to give some simple practical things, suggestions on sort of how to manage a visit if right. you have a veteran in your office. Do that, uh, do a gut check on yourself first um, before even seeing the veteran. Humble yourself, try to be open and focused. Remember I mentioned earlier, um, respect the different worldview that this individual may have from yourself and make it a co-learning experience unpretentious, compassionate, no false praise, because we, we pick up on that rather quickly. Uh, you don't greet want them. to be called a hero. No, it's, it's not what we're looking for. It's really not. It's, it's a, that's sort of a false praise. That I pass that on to a police officer or a fireman, someone saving a life. Um, but greet directly, eye to eye contact, look them directly in the eye. Uh, be honest, kind, and, and firm with what you're trying to say to them. Um, walk in front. Uh, don't, hold, uh, don't hold doors open. Offer to keep the office door open if that makes them more comfortable. Encourage them to look around the office. Show them around the different corners. And uh, clarify your own veteran status. I'm not a veteran, or I am a veteran. I'm not a veteran. I, don't, I can't even begin to understand what you've experienced or gone through. What you've done for us at that moment is you've, you've taken us down uh, to where we're a little bit more comfortable and relaxed in that office environment with you. We're looking around, keep in mind, we're assessing that office. We're looking at your, your plaques. So we're looking at your, your education. We're looking at your jacket. We're looking at all this uh, that uh, you present to us. And we're trying to develop some level of um, uh, comfort and in your presence and clarify again your veteran status. Do not call them a hero as uh, my colleague has mentioned. And it's interesting you know that for us we don't think this way as a civilian that just coming to our office may actually be a trigger in itself to a veteran who has PTSD. The very thing that we think would should provide some comfort hopefully mm. uh, is actually a trigger. Give the advance uh, notice uh, and, and first ask permission uh, before entering their personal space or getting and coming in close to them. Confirm that uh, you have nothing to do with the VA Service Connected Disability uh, Education uh, process. Tell them you can opt for a different provider, uh, that they can if they choose to, and don't hide behind that the, your medical persona. Ask, always ask about suicide. Do you have thoughts of suicide? Yes, I do. You do, oh. Do you have a plan? Yes, I have a plan. It, it changes the dynamics of that conversation now changes quite a bit when you ask these questions. Do you think of suicide? No, I don't. Great. The uh, making, uh, when I work with veterans one at a time, uh, across the country, and particularly in my state of Maine, we, I, I deal with the eight dimensions of wellness, uh, as, and these eight dimensions of wellness are part of one's daily life. It's absolutely essential for me. Uh, the wellness is not the absence of illness or stress, for it is something we as veterans, we must manage for the rest of our lives. We know this. As veterans, we can continue to strive for wellness uh, as we continue to experience these challenges, as I do every day uh, in our lives. I, I call this, this image you see here, I call it the mix. And uh, it's 
the activities we choose um, on our own, we are empowered to choose, and when we choose, uh, we, they reflect on our own personal passions. I'm Passamaquoddy, so my Native American culture is important to me. And the eight dimensions of wellness is a deliberate and has a deliberate and overlapping manner in, in the process here. In my own personal mix, uh, the wellness therapies, my passions, um, it's again my Native American culture, it's my horses, it's strength training, it's meditation, it's outdoor experience adventure, it's culinary cooking. These are my passions. These are the things that affect my nervous system. For me, that's how it feels. They affect my nervous system. My most important primary wellness is my equine psychotherapy that I receive with 40 plus horses that I train and work with that calms me, relaxes me. I combine it with my other wellness modalities that I uh, use interchangeably day in and day out, uh, week after week for the rest of my life. As and, I and I'd like to interject something, pardon me. I think for those of us in the medical <clears throat> profession, it's sometimes uh, we're, we're accustomed to a pathological sort of base model. We think of our usual interventions, pharmacologic and other. But if you think yourself, um, the, the notion of wellness, we underestimate the Im importance and the impact that wellness activities have. If you think of them as almost the equivalent of medicinal things, we have to somehow change our thinking about them is the point, I guess, that they are powerful. Uh, and it's going to be a little bit of a leap and challenge for us in the medical profession. Pardon me, Rob. That's, that's fine. The uh, mix for me provides enormous benefits, um, personally health benefits, but also reciprocally when I'm offering these to veterans one at a time, sharing them with my veteran brothers the, the many uh, benefits of, of these uh, wellness modalities on the verge of suicide, a lot of these veterans that are sent to me. For myself, this has a calming effect uh, on my nervous system, and my brain, that's what it does for me. And um, the eight dimensions of wellness is, uh, this is the preferred order that I, and this is important when I'm working with veterans one-on-one, -on -one, um, I receive a veteran and I'm not jumping to occupational. Let's talk about a job. Let's talk about your finances. Veteran is completely lost at this. What I'm doing is I'm standing in a field with my horses and I'm listening. I'm listening to this veteran, him or her, where she's been, what she's done. I don't need to tell my story. I listen to their story. I respect their worldview and I start with emotional. I always start with the emotional coping effectively with life and creating satisfying relationships with the emotional for them. The horse, as I mentioned earlier, teaches me my virtues, the many virtues. Pardon me, I want to interrupt Rob again. He may get annoyed with me, but that's okay. Um, I want you to be thinking while he's talking, imagine yourself being on the hook, so to speak, that the, someone has come to you and said, you are now bearing responsibility for this person who has said, you know, we have had people sent to Rob that have gone through Mass General's program and other very, you know, significantly effective programs, and they're just done. They want to take themselves out. They are done. And imagine you being that person responsible to think, what am I going to do? How can I help this human being? find a way to keep himself or herself alive. So as you're listening, imagine what you would do. It's a, it's a tightrope. It's a very tricky situation. I'm trying to get them to flip that switch off. Today, tomorrow, they're going to end their life. I acknowledge that. I say, you're talking about suicide. Yes, you have a plan. Yes, I do. And they're not afraid of death. No, they're not afraid of death at all. Uh, not at all. And I say, I understand. How do you, how do you mean you understand? I say, because I was there three years ago. I wanted to end my life. And if it wasn't for my, my American Native elders, uh, I don't think I'd be here talking to you. I get their attention. And in getting their attention, uh, again, it's the emotional wellness that's important first, the spiritual, environmental, that's good health. Um, it's the spiritual is the purpose and meaning in life, them understanding that, discovering it for themselves. Um, environmental is simply the good health and occupying stimulating environments that support well-being. Physical is important for me. It absolutely is. It, it, it literally affects my cortisol levels in my brain. I've been through um, uh, brain TBI centers uh, across the country 
and uh, the physical, recognizing the need to honor my body, this cell, if you will, and with physical activities, healthy foods, and sleep, which has been extremely difficult for me my whole life, averaging three hours a night, two to three hours a night. Now I get my sleep, I really do. Social is, we're moving along this, this matrix here, we're moving up the ladder, if you will, the rungs of this ladder, and we're now moving towards the social, developing a sense of connection and belonging. I get this through my horses. Many of my, my horses satisfy a large majority of these wellness modalities. Of course, I have the overlapping wellness modalities of music and cello and flute and drumming. And I do this with my horses in the field. When veterans see me doing this, they're like, they just cannot imagine uh, and they want a piece of this, they want to share in this, they want to find their own uh, their own journey and path to wellness. And but you have to remember, I'm doing it again, he's really mm. annoyed now, mm. but the point is that you have to think again, imagine yourself as, as a veteran, you can hear Rob, he's talking about, it's almost like becoming a human being again, right? It, if is, you, it is. Right, like relearning how to be a human being in the civilian world. So things that we take uh, as sort of customary, you know, like you hear about the, the things he's talking about wellness, you may be dismissive of it even, but imagine yourself having to retrain yourself to be a human being. And a veteran approaching me into two months, three months down the road and saying, the tears in his eyes saying, I, I don't know how I'm going to pay you back. I don't know what I can do for you to show you my appreciation. And I say, you never pay me back. You never pay me back. You never pay me back. You pay it forward. You pass it on to another veteran. You help another veteran. You help another veteran and receive the gift of helping others, those in need. And when you see the reciprocal benefit of that coming back on you and, and how much of a wellness and, and therapy it is for you, you'll be amazed at how you feel. Uh, we go from social, we go to intellectual and recognizing the creative abilities of finding ways uh, to enjoy and expand these intellectual gifts. Um, mine is music and culinary cooking and examples like that. Uh, occupational, we, this is down the road. This is a veteran now whose switch is turned off. They don't want to die. They've found something. They've found purpose. They've reestablished trust. They have hope and they've found renewed purpose in themselves first with their families and then community. We are talking about occupational down the road, six months, a year, two years, three years later from veterans who are calling me from all over the country, checking in on me, checking in on me. And I'm thinking, this is amazing. And just, I love you. And I want to know how you're doing. And I'm thinking, is this the same fellow I met a year and a half ago that was sworn to, to end his life? So, so the financial and occupational are the wellness modalities uh, or steps that we go through. The next slide is, uh, this is myself, one of the wellness modalities of meditation. I'm doing it with uh, the calming and transcending together with many of my horses. The experience of two souls connecting and sharing the energy can be extremely powerful in many, we in many, many ways. A gift received only through, uh, that I received only through my elders and uh, as a gift and gratitude I hold for them forever for sharing and teach me, teaching me this. Um, next slide is again uh, a dear brother of mine, my Taliban, Native American brother. Uh, cleansing, you ever hear that term cleansing? So in my culture cleansing is very very important coming back. First step, cleansing, cleansing the heart, cleansing the soul and uh, no one knows it better than the uh, Native American community. Uh, seeking guidance from spirit grandfathers and Mother Earth. This is all extremely powerful in finding one's purpose again and cleansing the soul. So it turns out that some of the Native American traditions could be very helpful to us non-Native uh, folks who are particularly coming back from combat. Mm -hmm. uh, the cleansing sort of rituals, for example, and I think that uh, deserves some more attention and, and uh, consideration. Absolutely. absolutely. Here are some uh, examples of men and women I've worked with and uh, the very different people, many of them today, the reciprocal benefit. I receive just as much healing as they receive um, by working together. And uh, this happens to be one of my very special horses. Uh, next slide. I'll turn over to 
So, Dr. Ben Grasso. As we're coming near the end, just to, for those of you who are not veterans, uh, here in the room and, and elsewhere, uh, a couple of books that have been recommended. I, I find that by reading, I, I learn a lot, obviously, but it, it helps sort of carry me away and gives me a sense of uh, what it, perhaps what it must be like. I will never understand the same way Rob understands, obviously. But one book that is very powerful is called Matterhorn by Carl Marlantis, who is a veteran, and it's about a Marine Corps experience in Vietnam. Another that many of you have probably been exposed to and read is uh, The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien, again, a Vietnam veteran who wrote about his, his experience. There are many other books, but these are two examples of something that will at least uh, transiently bring you into their world, and you can sort of imagine a little bit of what it must be like. So uh, in summary, I'll try to just give you a couple of reminders of where we've been here today. Uh, the, the point is to see if you would consider adding to the usual medical repertoire some things that are not usually among uh, what we have learned in medicine. One is this broad sense of military literacy, which is my way of saying to really challenge yourselves to, if you want to have some empathy, to really learn something about our veteran brothers and sisters and where they've been. And there's lots of ways of doing that. The uh, wellness immersion. Well, this, you've heard, oh, I'm sorry. You yep. Another would be this notion of body alarm management. Again, there's some simple ways of rethinking uh, what's going on with PTSD, normalizing the experience, uh, and perhaps, perhaps uh, our veterans might. Uh, it, I'd like to believe that the suicide rate even potentially could be impacted by helping veterans to see that they are not as, uh, as crazy or horrific as they imagine themselves to be. And sometimes simple uh, information can help with that, a reformulation. The wellness immersion is what we've been talking about that I use with veterans one-on-one. -on -one. And intensive equine assisted therapy for myself is, is a very, very powerful primer for myself that uh, satisfies a lot of the um, uh, dimensions of wellness. Uh, and uh, using that w in conjunction with uh, veterans as a intentional peer support navigator. Again, sh appreciating and sharing uh, independent, separate worldviews, not judging, listening. And uh, I get the same with working with horses, the non-judgmental, forgiving, um, so, uh, and the part that, that's hard to capture in this, and I don't understand it the way Rob does, and if you get behind the words, mm -hmm. that there's something about having a veteran uh, work with a veteran and work in the presence of this extraordinary being, a horse, uh, that somehow brings a sense of calming and hope and other things that we don't know how to measure, we don't know how to codify, but it seems to be a very powerful intervention. And at an intuitive level, in your heads, I'm sure it can make sense as you think about it. Some of the last links here uh, I certainly want to share with you. Um, and it's a different journey, a documentary uh, where I was followed around the country for two years uh, by a medical university, University of New England, from California to Texas, up through uh, Illinois, North Carolina, uh, back to the Northeast. And there's a link for you. Uh, my Gmail, uh, my uh, uh, email uh, contact is there. Uh, you've heard me mention a few things about the moral obligation. There's a very powerful link, uh, veteran brother Mike H Haney, that has a very powerful, very powerful YouTube presentation. And, um, and I, I would like to say, you know, would, would you agree, you know, listening to us today and sharing, being able to share what we have with you, that we all have a moral obligation to, to get to know one veteran? I asked the question, how many, people, how many folks here have a son, a daughter, a family member um, that was in the, involved in the conflicts or over there now? This is not, no surprise, uh, we, if we're addressing larger audiences, uh, it's, a, it's a very small percentage that raise their hands and say, you know, yes. Uh, so we are never surprised to see a fairly small percentage of uh, people in the audience. And so we do, I, I, I wanna say I, I feel we all have an, a moral obligation to get to know one veteran. How many here, people here today, uh, may I ask, uh, can you make it, can you consider making it your mission to get to know one veteran? One veteran, just each and every one of you, one veteran. And uh, I'll ask you the final question, and that is how many of you will go as far as to ask a friend? 
a neighbor or a relative uh, to make it their mission to get to know one veteran. Um, we're free to take questions if What's the difference in the suicide potential in a non-veteran versus a veteran? Depression is involved in both, and do you, how is the management medically different in terms of medications, antidepressants, and so forth? Are they part of the regimen and, and so on? You want to take that? Non-veteran versus? It's, you know, I'm trying to figure out what's the difference here with the, the veteran. Is it a self-destructive, more of a self-destructive, um, self-hatred kind of motivation, or is there uh, I some self-hatred there, or is it this depression like we see in the non-veteran that yeah. results in That's a very good question. The question, in case some could not hear it, is if I understood correctly, in the, uh, approaching a veteran versus a non-veteran, what's the difference really in the, like with depression and the risk of suicide? clinically what is different. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. In my experience, uh, the, you have to sort of go back quite a ways to start to think about how veterans think because they think so utterly differently. Uh, I think it is a very different uh, kind of visit than a visit with a civilian. With a civilian, for me, I talk about and ask about hopelessness and despair and talk about the presence of death in our lives. It's in all of our lives. And, you know, if there, is there true syndromal depression? Have there been losses? The usual things we've been taught to ask about is precipitance. And, um, and that, it's a pretty, con pretty uh, familiar model. In the, in the veteran world, it's different. It is, I, I, I think the biggest challenge for us is to really, to literally try to think like a combat veteran. If you're coming back, are you a veteran? You personally? Not combat. Not combat, but a veteran. Yeah. Yeah. So you know better than I do. Um, but at least having had the training, however you served, uh, what did you do? I was a physician. Yeah, so in what capacity and where? In the state. <laughs> In the States, the McDill Air Force Base. Yeah. And at what time period? Uh, early, um, well, mid 70s. Yeah. So just post Vietnam. Yeah. Yeah. So you probably saw and heard quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. So, again, you know more than I do about this. My, and you could probably answer the question better, I think, but to me, the, I, it sounds perhaps dreadfully simple minded. But I need to stop before each veteran comes in my office when I was taking care of veterans and start from the frame of reference of trying to imagine myself having been a LERP, having been in country for you know, 11 months and behind enemy lines and the training and the experience and then the experience in country uh, and trying to imagine what it's like coming back. I think depression, uh, some, there can be some similarities, but I, to me, when it comes to the issue of suicide, and I, I'd really like Rob to comment on this, to me there, there are often different reasons. There, veterans have, have talked about wanting to be back in the fray, you know, desperately sometimes wanting to get out of here and go back. They wish that, or the LERP, he wished he could go back to Vietnam. He wished he could just turn time back. He was happier and more comfortable and fit in better there. This world did not seem navigable to him. So giving him a sense of hope in this world is complicated. Uh, he missed his brothers that he, that he lost and felt a sense of guilt in not having, in having survived and they didn't. That's something that in the civilian world, I mean, people have survivor's guilt, but it's not a direct parallel. So I think it's a different ball game. You have to be comfortable exploring these sorts of ideas uh, and issues with them. Absolutely, it, we're, we're talking about connecting and we're coming back and we really, desperately want to connect back. We want to connect back with our community. But we can't. We're trying to connect with our family. We can't. And we're struggling. And we're asking for help. We're not receiving it. And our family infrastructure is disintegrating. And I had a purpose. I really did. Men followed me. I was a leader. I had skills. And now I can't seem to find my purpose. 
my family wants me to move out. I really am much better off. My family is much better off if I just check out. And that's a complicated situation then, isn't it? How do you sort of bring a sense of hope to someone who's thinking that way? And where do you draw the links? Where are the supports? What do you do next as he walks out the door? You'd be shocked, or maybe, perhaps, maybe not, to realize that uh, uh, one stat that came out was how many American businesses here in America would hire a veteran. Well, you'd think 100%. 90% would hire him. 80% would hire him. 60% would hire him. 35. 35%. If you're lucky, no, we'll, so we'll hire you because no, of your experience. Rob, what is the actual number? It, it's actually closer down to about 20, down to about 20%. So if you're lucky. If right. you're lucky, yeah, down to about 20%. You come back and you want to reconnect, and you can't find a job. Your family is just uh, at odds and, and with you and, and just is, in, is desperate to try to understand your anguish and your pain, and you can't explain it. Um, but there are real issues on both sides. There on is. the civilian side, if you have a young man, let's say, that's come back and has done, I can imagine a fellow who's done two tours that I remember who uh, had such horrific rage. You know, he was knocking down doors and shooting people up and doing extraordinary things. He was so dreadfully bored. He missed the adrenaline rush. He was looking for work. He was going to drive a delivery truck or something. He gets so angry with road rage and other things. And, and if he had a problem with somebody, he was going to solve it in a fairly direct and physical way. He had to sort of unlearn some of that and relearn the civilian way of managing. So I can, on the other hand, you have the extraordinary training. You, we have our moral obligation, I think, to serve veterans and to help them re reconnect. Uh, you have people who can be intensely loyal if you connect with them and give them a chance. Uh, and who can learn to, to sort of manage some of the rage and some of the impulsivity and, and the tendency to use substances to try to quiet down all the re-experiencing and all. But it's a challenge, but part of our point is that we, you gotta kinda have it out on the table and really talk about it a bit more openly, I think, than is often done. Any other questions? Yeah, I just wanted to ask you, you know, I know that the initial return for combat veterans has gotta be one of the toughest times but I'm thinking also, even after people have assimilated, I'm thinking the suicide rates would still be higher than the civilian population. I just wanted to kind of know what the statistics are for those two different time periods. You know, like, I don't know if it's one year, two year, five years, and then, you know, a quiescent period, or, and then it may reawaken, or any ideas? It's a, it's a great question. It's tough. I don't have information on, uh, you know, I did, I did share. Uh, 20% of all suicides in this country are, are committed at the hands of veterans themselves while they only represent, that population only represents 10% of the overall population. But it's stratifying it like stratifying that. I don't know it. if the data is available. If it is, I'm not aware yeah. of what it is. Yeah. I know anecdotally that I've had veterans who have, you know, Vietnam vets. I think if, you know, any of those issues can come back. Exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, some things I think come back. For example, as, as veterans age and you go into your 50s and 60s, mm. it's quite natural to sort of, you're turning back more than forward. As our future is shrinking, you know, and our past is growing, there's a tendency to be more reflective upon the past. And I've seen that sort of re, you know, uh, a recrudescence and intensifying of PTSD, that m memories were coming back with more intensity. Um, so it's not a simple thing years apart from the actual experience and exposure to trauma doesn't necessarily mean that it's easier to tolerate. And, and even recognizing who's at risk for that, I mean, right. you know, I'm thinking the, popul the veteran combat population would be a, a greater number at large, but how do you identify the ones that, where it's coming back and the ones that it's not coming back? Honestly, the moral obligation that I talked about earlier, it's that coming together as a village, coming together as a community, and I have these uh, community clinics, uh, it takes a village, and what I do is I invite uh, wellness therapists, uh, I'm talking yoga, I'm talking acupuncture, I'm talking equine assisted therapy, I'm, I'm talking the folks that live in the community, and we come together like this, 80, 100, 150 people strong, and uh, oftentimes the folks that facilitate these clinics are shocked that these are my neighbors? They're here in this community? 
and then we can talk about how we can move forward and offer these services as a village, as a community, to our veterans within that community. And I believe communities have the greatest strength and power to influence the immediate population of veterans right in their own community. Back to your point also, uh, and Rob understandably is very focused on the wellness issue because again when you're living with this stuff you want to think of what and you know your brothers and sisters are out there what can they do today to feel better there mm -hmm. here's a, a range of things that can make you feel better today but back to your issue imagine it, you're not a veteran I'm not imagine if you had had one instance of combat right one one firefight uh, you know, it would have been probably the most intense and extraordinary experience in your life. It will never go away as a memory. Think of your own memories of intense experiences any of you have had. The more intense it was, it, the more present, you know, the more it's preserved. It does not go away. Uh, so imagine having a series of them in a, in a course of one deployment. Imagine more than one deployment. Of course that stuff's in there. And the triggers that can come up from those kinds of experiences are not unheard of, you know, a sharp, loud noise or a door slamming or, well, it's got to be endless. Yeah, it is endless. I, there are some special forces guys that have come to see me at Mercy Hospital back in Maine, mm. even just to visit, and the hallways are unsecured to them. What are all these doors that no one knows who's, you know, no one's walked through and cleared them, and, and we don't think that way. But for him, just coming into the building was an issue, so I would always meet him outside. Your question? The only hospital I've ever seen that has good security is the one in Napa Valley, California, right next to that uh, base with the little spacecraft. Okay, and what made it so They secure? challenge you when you go in there and say, why are you here? Oh, is that right? And walk into other ERs and stuff. Everywhere I've been to 48 states. Are you a veteran? Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Air Force. Great right. surgeon. Yeah. Thank you for your service. Combat, combat vet. Yeah. So you think differently. So the only yeah, base yeah, I've read all of Mark Zinko's books. Yeah, What's he doing? He's doing, he's doing great. He's, um, you know, he's, uh, he, he has his... I guess he's written a few more. Yeah, he's, he was my first commanding officer, and uh, I have a, a world of respect for him. And he's an intense individual. To have him as your commanding officer is... is uh, I can't think of any really tougher situation than to face him. But the respect I have for him is immense, and um, he's a, he was a leader for me, and I've carried on uh, in his... Um, in the model that uh, he shared with me. My associate here is, uh, her great uncle is uh, Herbert K. Peely Lao. You know of him? I didn't know. No. Medal of Honor, Korean War, Heartbreak Ridge. Mm -hmm. Nice. He made the movie. Mm -hmm. And he's made the movie. Oh, uh, yes. 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 Distinguished Hawaiian family, and they just have a USS Peely Lao in Hawaii. Sister ship is the Anchorage and the San Antonio, and we went to the commissioning here in 13. Nice. As guests. Very nice. So, has sure. this made sense to you what we've oh, yeah. done? No. Yeah. Good. Is that my my uh, stepsister's young son is working for the Four Star in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. with a, he's a, tra a Chinese translator expert. And the problem is interdicting Chinese communications as they're trying to steal more and more of our technology. Mm -hmm. I was an F 15 flight attorney. Look at combat aviation, you all. Just read that magazine. You can buy down Barnes and Noble and see what's going on every month. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you all. I wanted to uh, maybe just speak from uh, on maybe a woman's please, please do. Um, I'm a veteran as well, but I'm still in the Air National Guard. Last Air National Guard served two tours from 2005, 2004 to 2000. And five, so I was gone a total of 18 months on the first floor, and I was in public affairs, assigned to public affairs, and I did get to go out, um, they mistakenly sent me out on a combat mission, I stayed about three weeks out in the mountains, and then a pop, small pop there in Afghanistan, and <clears throat> we were garden bases and stuff, got shot at, but, you know, you talk about the anxiety, and your heart feel like you're, it's leaving your body. You know, there's a few times you feel like you've given up your life and all this stress that's related to it coming back. And then I surfed again from 2012 to 2013. But like when I came back from a woman's perspective, it was like a lot of anger and a lot of frustration. I wasn't, um, <clears throat> you know, 
you know, like you said, I didn't want to be noticed. I, mm -hmm. I wanted to just come back and pretend nobody knew me. Mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of hide. I didn't want nobody to see what I did. Uh -huh. I didn't, like you said, we didn't want to be called heroes. Mm -hmm. But then there was this anger and frustration. I was in myself. I, my friends were even saying, you're not the same person. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, just let me. I told my family, do not come down to Anchorage. Do not see me for three weeks to a month. I want to kind of mm -hmm. get settled back in. And, you know, they wanted to come and see me. But I was like, no, I, I don't want nobody to tell me what yeah. to do. I don't want to do anything. I just want to kind of immerse back into Anchorage life and be quiet. But... Then I found myself, it was just, um, I wasn't the same. I was angered, I was frustrated. I didn't want to go to stores, I didn't want to shop. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, I, I didn't connect with the military for three months, I signed back in. I told them I was gone for three months because they give us a three month leave. And I said, see you later, I'm very angry at you people. I do not want to come back for three and a half months. They said, so, so be it, okay. I took off, I went on a three, week vacation, um, but still I was trying to run from myself. Yeah. Yeah. And I, the thing that got a, my attention was, you're not the same. I was trying to go nowhere fast. Yes. I looked down at the odometer one time and I was speeding at 100 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. And I said, I wasn't trying to kill myself. I wasn't mm -hmm. trying to hurt myself. I, I was just trying to get somewhere because I had wasted all this time. I felt like I wasted the last 18 months in somebody else's hat and I, I was missing out. I needed to go see family. I needed to be around them. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did and I went to probably every, up and down the highway trying to immerse myself back into the beauty of Alaska because that was a year and a half, oh. a year of just seeing mud and dust and mm -hmm. that anger was still there. So I, I prayed a lot. I went to church, tried to connect back with my my people and my elders, and cried out to God and said, I need help. Mm -hmm. I, I really need help. And after praying and praying, he said, go get the, uh, go get the counseling. So I went to the VA and I said, I do need, I need anger management. So I took two and a half months of anger management. Mm -hmm. Good for you. I'm and glad you found that. I'm glad you found that. And then connecting with my people and my elders, that's what, because they directed me the right way. And mm -hmm. because my friends, they were like, you're not the same, you you need to do mm -hmm. something, nobody wants to be around you. I said, I don't even want to be around my own self, but it took those changes and it was like two and a half months and finally um, I started to see my anger slowly reside. And I don't want to call it PTSD, but and I don't relate it as a mental thing because all of us at some point in our life have um, had PTSD. Sure. There's traumatic things that happened in our life and it's just our way of dealing with that trauma. Yeah. But some people have had it over and over mm -hmm. and they never get um, you know, the treatment in between these short terms of the trauma happening to the, the veterans that keep going back over. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it just gets more severe. But I think from a female point of view, a woman can say, hey, I need help. But from a guy's point of view, it's like, no, I'm going to deal with this on my own. Yeah. I'm a man. Perceived as a weakness. Yes. Yes. Perceived oh. as a weakness. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. Um, that's, our, that's our talk today. Uh, well, let me just say, yeah. that that's a, such a yeah. perfect example of it. And it I know is. we have to stop. But I don't know how many of your colleagues know what you've done and you know, how you've served, but... Um, yeah, I served a year in uh, Bagram, Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. I was public affairs, and I was supposed to be um, staying on the base doing media and bidding and writing articles, but then some commander decided he wanted to be a jerk and send me out on a combat mission and do some public mm -hmm. affairs story, but then when the base commander found out, he was like so mad, he tried to get me back, but there was no flights coming back in yeah. from the fog. So mm. I, it was like two and a half to three weeks before I could get back on a flight, you know, flight on one of the Blackhawks. But by that time, it was, I already saw combat firsthand and it was like, you know, running and right. 
Um, and that's part of the point of our of having this conversation is that there are people like you here everywhere, you know, who I have served and have quite a story to tell. And we have we owe you an obligation, like we owe Rob and mm. and this gentleman and the fellow that left an obligation. And that's really a big part of what we've tried to impart to you today. So I do know we need to finish up. I'd like to thank you very much. Guyana.